Please sit down. I now know why at Christmas I got a notepad because otherwise I wouldn't have had any notes for my sermon this morning um, because I couldn't print them out. Um, But if I can turn you please to that passage that we just uh, looked at together, 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 17 to 11 verse 15. And if we were to summarise this passage, uh, it would be quite easy to do. Saul is crowned king, he is acknowledged by the people, and he, his first <coughs> battle is one in which he experiences success. But woven into the story is something that's rather peculiar, and that is that on the one hand there seem to be verses that say it's good for Israel to have a king and on other occasions that in fact God does not approve of the king. Or you could put it even more complicatedly than that in a sense, God both approves and disapproves the appointment of the king. And that ought to prompt you to ask what on earth is going on here. Why does this same passage seem to reflect two completely different views? Now the simple answer to that that's been offered by scholars down down the years is that actually the person who put this book of 1 Samuel together uh, did a very bad bit of editing here. He's drawn upon two different sources Uh, One that's a pro-king party source and one is an anti-king party source and he's been such an idiot that when he's put it together he's not noticed the conflicting views and just stitched or cut and pasted the thing and stuck them together. Now I don't know about you but when I come up with scholars coming up with ideas like that I think what planet are they on? Um, They they come up with arguments like that often enough, uh, but what sort of planet are they on? Do they think that these people who put together the Old Testament books were were, were such numbskulls? So perhaps the numbskulls are the modern scholars who don't actually ask why then is there this here? What is actually going on? So we need to try and work out that answer and I think in working out the answer we will begin to see the application of this passage to us. So Samuel was requested to choose a king and he calls the people together at Mizpah for the coronation uh, to reveal so far the unknown choice that God has made and the person that Samuel has anointed. And Samuel reminds them that their demand fails to reckon with the fact of their history. That's what happens right at the beginning of that passage. Do you see? This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I brought Israel up out of Egypt and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you, but you have now rejected your God. Now this isn't the last time that Samuel said it. It's not the first time either. We'll find in the passage that we look at again next Sunday that Samuel makes exactly the same point. That God had delivered Israel, he had been their king, and the request for a king, therefore, was actually an act of disobedience. It was saying we would sooner have a human being do the work for us. We would have looked to human expedience to help us rather than look to God himself. And so that's the point that Samuel makes uh, in those first verses. And I would suggest to you that the lesson is one that we ourselves need to learn. I've said to you in the past that I can remember, especially when I was in pastoral ministry in London, that I would receive regular mail that invited me to this or that meeting, usually at a rather posh hotel in the centre of London, um, uh, to be told how I could successfully be a man of God and I could pastor my church and I could fill the pews and all this sort of stuff uh, uh, and 
every so often I received these invitations. The thing that always troubled me about that was that it was actually, people were coming up with uh, answers to how to be successful, how to be successful Christians, how to be a successful church, but very often the assumption was you take this particular route, you adopt this particular strategy that I've adopted, and hey presto, you'll find success. The thing was, it left God out of account. It was assuming that this particular strategy, this idea, this particular uh, means of doing this or that or the other, in and of itself almost, would automatically convey the success of growing the church and bringing about revival or whatever it might be. Now, this passage reminds us that that simply isn't true. Victory is always the Lord's. It's always the Lord's. If, if, if the church is blessed, if you and I uh, uh, experience God's work within our lives in a unique and special way, it is not because we've adopted the right strategy. The, the victory is always the Lord's. And the people needed to be reminded of that that the victory is the Lord's. That's not to say that human strategies are not appropriate. We'll come back to that in a moment or two. But it is to say that the vital issue that we need to get into our heads is that the victory is his. The verse that's been keep going round in my head this last week or two, be, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. It's his work. It's what he does. We need to look to him, and the people had failed at this point to look to him. Despite the history of God's dealings with them, they, they had failed to do so. And Samuel therefore points out to them that their request, insofar as they had made it the way that they had, betrayed their lack of dependence upon God. And yet, the Lord does use means. And here he uses Saul, of course. Now, what I find interesting is, despite Saul's obvious qualifications, he was a bit of a giant. He was sort of um, Israel's equivalent of Mr. Universe. Um, he was the obvious sort of person to have uh, as your leader. Um, despite his obvious qualifications, those are not stressed here. Yes, when Samuel, uh, when Saul is got from his hiding place, he stands a head taller than any of the others. He was, he was a sort of uh, Israel's equivalent of Goliath. Uh, he's well equipped to be the sort of leader they're looking for, but in fact you'll notice that that's not what is stressed here. It's mentioned, but it is certainly not emphasised. So the story is less interested in Saul's natural qualifications than in the quality of the life that he then demonstrated. And I want you to notice this. First of all, we notice that Saul recognised his human unfitness for the task. That's why he hid. He did not feel ready for the task. The task seemed altogether too much for him to do. I think anybody who enters into any form of leadership in the Christian church, if they do not enter into it with that particular view, they are already on the wrong track. When we enter the ministry of the gospel, whether it's ordained ministry or whatever ministry it is, uh, we are, humanly speaking, unfit for the task. Um, so as far as Saul was concerned, if he could have run away, he would have done. Um, and if, if the people see, see Saul as the answer to their needs, Saul is only too well aware that actually he is not, he does not have the qualifications or the qualities or the resources that will enable him on his own 
to achieve what the people wish to see. So the first thing we discover here about Saul was his, uh, was his humility. The second thing we notice is that that humility is outworked in the way that he responds to others. How can this fellow save us? And even at the end of the chapter, there is a suggestion that... Uh, um, bring these men to us that we will put them to death. The people who'd been doubting, because after all, Saul has now proved the sort of person he is. And once again, Saul is not willing to respond to the people's request. You know, those in authority sometimes like to throw their weight around. Saul and claim an authority. They uh, insist on certain titles. Uh, they insist on being given a certain dignity, because after all, this is who they are. One of the things that struck me over the last week or two, while I've been away in France, is that I've been <coughs> mixing with people who, uh, uh, in some respects, uh, are people who have a great dignity. But I normally found myself sitting down um, at lunch and at tea um, in the next seat to an archbishop who simply treated me as an ordinary human being and I treated him as, Norman, uh, as an ordinary human being. He was not laying claim to the authority of his position but seeing his position as the basis upon which he could serve his church. Of course, when Saul is first challenged with, uh, well, what sort of fellow are you? He, he didn't even have a track record to prove anything, did he? He could have stamped and stomped and got all cross and heat, heated under the collar. Who do you think I, I am? I'm the Lord's anointed. But the answer is, you may be the Lord's anointed, but where's the evidence for it? And the evidence for it was in what followed. So he doesn't respond to authority by throwing his weight around. And no true Christian leader will ever be someone uh, who throws their weight around, who insists on their way, uh, who acts in a bullying and a harassing manner. A true Christian leader is someone who is only too aware of their weakness, not only aware of their weakness, but also uh, is humble enough to acknowledge that but for the grace of God they have no gifts and no abilities and no proof of their ministry. And then he lives humbly among the people. I love this little bit. You know, Saul has just been made king. So you think the first request is going to be, will you build me a palace? No request is made. We discover that when there's a problem with Nahash, that Saul is out in the fields doing his job as a farmer. He's not son suddenly said, this job is too much beneath me. Uh, others can do it now. He is still actually obedient to his own father and serving as the farmer he was and remained. He lived humbly in the midst of his people. He might be king, but high office in God's, among God's people is for those ready to serve and not lorded over the people. That's why we sometimes sing, don't we, about the servant king, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the servant king. Because he entered into this world, he set aside all that he was. We've reflected today on Trinity Sunday, on who Jesus is. And yet for all of that he set aside in order that he might serve your need and mine. That is the mark of a true leader. And then we notice his success was wholly dependent upon the Spirit of God at work through him. When Verse 6 of chapter 11, when Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power and he burned with anger. I was reflecting interestingly that when the Spirit of God is present sometimes we can be angry. Uh, but that's not the point I particularly want to make here this morning. It is more that the Spirit of God was the empowering of Saul and it was the Spirit of God that brought Saul 
success. Those of us who know the story will know, of course, that in the in the it, in, that the sequel is somewhat poignant. As Saul's life proceeded, he abandoned it, the dependence upon the Spirit of God and even sought uh, deceiving spirits uh, to guide him. But he started well, and to this extent he sets before us a model. Under, and under Saul's leadership and organisation, the first threat to God's people was overcome. And then finally, I've, picked, I've pointed it out already in a sense, but notice how he was magnanimous with those who doubted him, even in the face of victory. And he did that because he recognised that it was the victory was the Lord's. The people had asked for a king, they'd asked for a king uh, who would lead in place of the Lord. What they discover certainly in the early days is Saul recognises that though he is God's king, uh, he is only effectively the Lord's prince. The work is the Lord's. He is merely the means by which the Lord uh, brings success. You know, spiritual success can easily turn the head. We see blessing in a particular area of God's ministry in our lives and we, our heads are turned and we pat ourselves on the back and we expect others to pat our, our backs too and to congratulate us on uh, our success. But actually spiritual success is always down to the Lord. And humans, human beings may sometimes uh, miss uh, what God is doing altogether. I found it very interesting this week being out in France and being told the history uh, of the monastery. Some of it I knew. But it was founded, the, the work there was founded by someone uh, who lived on his own in this wood uh, for quite a number of years, uh, gradually di gathering disciples to himself. By the time uh, he had been there for some time, he had about 22 disciples uh, who uh, he'd ordained and sent out into ministry. By the time he died, they'd all left him. When he died, his work seemed to be a complete and utter shambles and disaster. Uh, my wife and I were given a bottle of wine as I left on Friday. Um, it was a bottle of wine which I'm told is a very good vintage. Uh, we shall find out in due course. But, but the wine was actually uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of this man first establishing uh, his hermitage in that forest. Ten years after his death, others came and established the work there in the spirit that he'd intended it to be. He never ever lived to see it but the work of God's blessing has rested on that place since. Spiritual success might well have turned his head. At the time of his death, he would have felt that his ministry had been completely and utterly ineffectual. So, it can turn the head. Eventually, I think it turns Saul's head. It reminds us that if we're in leadership, and I have to apply this to myself first of all, it reminds me uh, that I'm called to live humbly before you and not to allow things to go to my head that might cause me to think more highly of myself than I ought. And so the people have every reason to rejoice in their king, reaffirm his rule as they do at the end of chapter 11 there. Um, but, and Saul prompts proves to be the sort of leader the Lord always intended for his people. And that explains the enigma that we started at the beginning of my talk with. How is it that in this one, in this one section there is both a pro and an anti-king view? The answer is the people had wrongly asked for a king to act on, in their place, in place of God. Saul proves to be a God certainly at the start of his life in which, uh, of his kingdom, in which 
he proves to be the one who is dependent upon God and therefore the sort of leader that God wished his leaders to be. How do we apply this as I close? Well, we're encouraged, I think, to reflect upon how we face up to the challenges we face as a people of God, whether it's at Ferndale or wherever. What attitude do we apply to our needs? What expectations do we have as to how we're going to resolve some of our difficulties? Are they looking to the Lord or are they looking to strategies that may sort things out? We need to be looking at strategies, but our first responsibility is to recognise that whatever strategies we may come up with, unless they are the Lord's strategies, and unless we've been led to them by him, and unless we are recognising that without him we have nothing that we can possibly achieve, then we've failed the test that is put out in these verses. And what sort of leaders are we to expect and honour Who are the sort of people we're looking for in leadership? Whether it's now or in the future. What are we looking for? What are the marks that will rest upon them that will show that they are God's choice? But my final word is this. We're reminded that Saul, the first anointed king of Israel, points forward to not only great David's greater son, but great Saul's. Uh, greatest son points forward to Jesus now there are of course marked contrasts Jesus had every right to claim and exercise high office and to receive obedience and the adulation of the people yet he more so even than Saul was the servant king who came to serve and give his life as a ransom for all his people. And therein lies the rub for each one of us. Because though he is a king, yet we are bidden to become members of his family. And becoming members of his family means that we will serve like him we will love and live like him. If we truly are begotten of the Spirit of God, of whom we've spoken this morning, then the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God the Father, who dwells in us, will make us to be like Jesus. We won't stand on ceremony. We won't claim our rights. We will live as those who, having been served and by the servant king will become servants of him uh, who is our king. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the challenge of this passage tucked away in the uh, corners of the Old Testament scriptures but a passage which as with all others is inspired by your spirit and given to us so that we may profit from it and learn to live in obedience to you as we reflect upon the lessons here we above all pray that you would help us to be like Jesus in all that we think, in all that we do, that we may show forth in our lives that quality of service that marks out him. So be with us, we pray, and bless us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're now going to sing our final song. I hope. <laughs>
and while they're settling down, uh, I'm preaching, I think, at um, South End Evangelical tonight, so if you, want to, if, you, if you feel you want to go for an evening service, up past six this evening, South End uh, Evangelical. <laughs> alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid 